similar to the morning, we're going to have some people come up here in threes and we'll ask them to give a presentation. And you, again, use your note cards if you want to talk because when we get done with it all, everybody will go back to the table and we'll have a chance to talk to each other uh, again. And then there will be a little bit of a report out from the tables right at the end so that we can capture any more brainstormed ideas that we will have. And answer the question. Yes, if we are teaching the answer code for this, I don't trust myself. Ask your friends. Okay. <laughs> Ask your friends. We're going to tell you what the answer But we have to try for okay. <laughs> but, 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 you know, there are plenty of people in the room who know these answers. So don't think, oh, no, I should know it. Just say, oh, man, I can't think what this is. What is it? And somebody will tell you. Because that's what we're supposed to do is help each other out. All right, so I would like to invite um, Jessica Jones Caporal to talk about the National League activities. And I'll spend a few minutes after you talking about the DC League. So, and then um, Emily Jenkins is not able to be with us. I'm so sorry to say she's not feeling well. And so we've actually asked our dear friend Michael Brown to talk about um, stand up for democracy. And then Kelsey, could you come too? Um, so if you, if Jessica, Kelsey, the DC vote, and Michael Brown can come up to the table so you can be at this microphone. representation in Congress. 
um, and the continued disenfranchisement of DC residents is rooted in racism at the highest level. Uh, and the League will continue to work to fight for the residents of DC and stamp out uh, this racial injustice. We've seen great progress in Congress over the last couple of years to make DC a state. We're grateful to um, the U.S. House of Representatives for passing H.R. 51 a couple of times. Um, and we're also grateful for the Senate to hold who has held a hearing, but there's still much more um, that needs to be done. Uh, so what can we do? Uh, if you're from D.C., uh, you know that there's not anyone that you can call in Congress. Um, but you can work with Anne and the LWDC to tell your friends and colleagues across the country about why this issue is so important and ask them other states to contact their members of Congress. The LWDC, LWDC has an amazing toolkit um, that uh, people can use to talk about the issue at house parties, at town halls, uh, at other community and other community events. They have the tools and resources uh, that grassroots leaders need to continue to build support for this issue, not just here at home in DC, but all across the country. Um, if you're from outside DC, uh, I just moved to Maryland, I'm very sorry. Um, please, please call your representatives and senators. I do that. I try to do that every week. Um, I'm going to tell you the capital switchboard number is 202-224-3121 um, and to be connected to the people that represent you. Um, tell them it's time for D.C. to have full rights and responsibilities of every other state and tell them it's time for D.C. to take it. Thank you. just add that uh, the League of Women Voters of the District of Columbia is intensely happy that we're getting this much uh, real support from the National League. Um, it has been uh, interesting over the time, um, and we're very happy that it's happening now in this really robust way. Um, for DC League, our purpose, our focus is on education. So we've been to 30 states. You'll, you've been watching this roll around. Oh, thank you, and S, for doing that for us. Um, and we've done lots of postcards to our friends and relatives, and more than likely we'll be doing it again in the very near future. So please feel free to call on us. And as I mentioned before, we have a team that will give uh, Statehood 101 presentations. They can be in person, they can be on Zoom. We have um, projectors and laptops so we can just show up and you know we're, we're ready to go to provide uh, UC Statehood education for anybody that you want us to come and talk to. Two people, eight people, 50 people, you name it, we'll do it. So that's that's my piece of it. Kelsey. Uh, well, Derek, can you see it? We're on now? Yeah. All right, so hey everybody, good afternoon. I am Kelsey Adams. I am the program director at DC Vote. Um, I'm pretty sure you guys are pretty aware of who DC Vote is. DC Vote is a state of advocacy organization advocating for state and equality for DC. Um, as a nonpartisan 501c3, we cannot, you know, we don't want to out of the fence. So we're trying to figure out ways to work with our friends across the aisle to ensure that DC becomes the first state. Um, before I leave today, I want more information from the league because I'm not a member, and I just don't know me that I'm actually not a member myself of the league, so I feel like that could be problematic that I'm up here, you know, <laughs> got a platform, I'm not a member myself, so I'll be trying to become a member today for sure. <laughs> Um, but to the nitty gritty, fight for DC statehood. So over at DC Vote, we are using what we call artistic activism. Um, and through this platform, we have decided to champion a campaign. It's titled Art Drive Statehood. Um, in that, we have an art canvas that we take with us to various locations. If you're looking at the nice little uh, video that Anne put together, you see 
a nice big canvas with like people standing in front looking like they're coloring. So that is our hard drive statehood canvas. Um, we have taken that to Project Low, as you see in the video. Um, we also went to Netroots. Um, that was in Pittsburgh about three weeks ago. Um, we had the people at Netroots um, kind of get involved with the statehood fight through coloring. Um, but that brings me to my point of where we are in this movement. So as I said, yes, I had my color on canvas and I never really had a great time. But what we see in the progressive movement is that the movement as a whole is not championing DC state. So throughout this movement, we're looking at climate change, all these voting rights issues, you name it, everybody's solution is two senators. The answer is DC state. So as we continue to move through the progressive movement and try to figure out different methods to take this fight outside of the beltway, I think first, as DC residents, we need to be more intentional on the fights that we need to plug ourselves in so that in those same arenas, they can put DC State at the top of those agendas. But furthermore, we need to make the fight more engaging and interactive. Unfortunately, panels like today are not the most inviting conversations. So for all clarity, we have been in this room since 9.30 a.m., some of you, and we have seen people trickle out throughout the day. The unfortunate part about DC statehood is we need people who are going to engage in the conversation the entire time to understand the complexities of this fight. So DC statehood on surface level just looks like 702,000 residents don't have a voice in Congress. So if you're not part of those 702,000 people and you live in one of the 50 states who are afforded the opportunity to vote in Congress, why would you care? So as a fight, we have to be more pragmatic about inviting the people in the 50 states to be involved in our fight and so that they can see how this benefits not just DC residents, but the nation as a democracy. We oftentimes say that we want to be the change that we see in the world, like Gandhi says, but we're not actively being that change. So we found that artistic activism pushes people who are normally not involved politically to become one more politically aware, but also politically engaged. I'm not sure if you guys heard about the fundraiser we had um, two weeks ago, August 31st. We had Sean Doolittle at, um, uh, what is that place called, the Atlas, with Art and Abels for sellout fundraiser. Sean Doolittle was the, uh, the picture for the match. He was the picture at the time that they won the championship. So that really used the art to drive statehood. Um, on the Sunday before the event, we were only maybe 20% uh, of sales. An article went out on the post that Sunday, the event was the next day, that Monday, and we sold out. So we went from 20%, found that 80%, and that's for 24 hours, and sold out at our entire event. It was great. It got the conversation going around the country for statehood, and probably in the baseball arena as well, because we saw some people, you know, in other states that looked like they could be involved, like in baseball, um, give some donations. But we do know that using influencers and art to drive this message is going to be what really brings it home. Well, thanks, everybody. Uh, I'm here to tell you a little bit about one, one of the first organizations that I ever encountered, uh, Stand Up for Democracy. First, let me just comment on something that our Franklin D.C. Vote said. This is really important that it's hard to make people in other places feel our pain. You know, nobody else in America has the situation that we have. They don't understand what it's like not to have representation in Congress. So when you talk about bringing the issues that really matter, racism, sexism, women's rights, all these other issues into the mix, you have to bring them so that people understand really what the problem is. Because they can't relate to, we have no representation. They all have one. So that being said, let me say a few things about stand-up. The first thing I want to say is that one of the long-term members of stand-up is George Robinson Paul, who's with us today. And if you have specific questions about stand-up, she might be a nice person to go over and ask. I'm speaking instead of Joyce, because Joyce is a candidate, and we all know that, that you know, the league is, is, is nonpartisan and doesn't support candidacy. So let me first say that one of the first people I met when I 
the first two people I think I met in the statehood movement after I was elected was Karen Zoli, my now assistant, who attacked me at the time of my elected. And because I said congressman instead of representative. Uh, and uh, Anise Jenkins. Anise Jenkins, who's head of stand-up, has been a stalwart in the fight for D.C. State. When we all stood next to Eleanor Holmes Gordon, I don't think there's a person in this room that doesn't respect Eleanor Holmes Gordon. I respect him more now that I've had a position without a vote and realize how hard the job really is. But when she was fighting to get a single vote in the House of Representatives, Many of us stood behind her because we wanted to see, we saw that as progress, that incremental progress. And these Jenkins was the one person that stood out there and said, no, stay here, stay here. That's what it should be. Everybody should be equal. There's no such thing as uh, conditional equality. You're either equal or you're not. And so I often call the niece and stand up the soul of this movement. Because she's always been there and she's always stood up for, for statehood. I'm sorry she's not here today, but they've been an important nonprofit in our fight. And you know, one thing that I, uh, I had a conversation with her one day, she's been on my podcast several times. I had a conversation with her one day about reaching out to America. As I said when I spoke, I think it's particularly important that we get our message that this is not just about D.C., this is about America, out. And she said to me, don't a lot of people come to D.C.? And I said, yeah, I really had not thought about it, but a lot of people come to D.C. And I checked, and we have literally tens of millions of people that come to the District of Columbia every year, and we don't promote them. There ought to be a statehood sign on every government building in Washington, D.C. You ought to be able to walk into the convention center and see a short film, or walk into National Airport and how they play those things about. And and we need to grow. We, we have so many people that come here to Washington that we really need to put up, we really need to stand up and, and, and let them know what our situation is. So I'm sorry she couldn't be here. If you have really specific questions, Joyce is the expert. I'm just a friend of, the, of, of this nonprofit and the niece and the people that work with it. Thanks. We've had thousands of veterans, of course, that have served our country, men and women. In our uh, organization, by the way, we have uh, on our board, one third of our board are women in Veterans United for uh, D.C. State. And what happens to be a, a, a lieutenant colonel, by the way, I salute her. And so we have a good mix of uh, fighters. And uh, I say to you this, I've got a lot about this 
stay there. And I began as a younger man, I'll be 80 soon. Uh, I, I worked with the front line from the very beginning. For me, you know, I thought about the thinking, and it's about freedom, you know, and, and I thought about it like that. My wife sometimes says, what do you want? Well, I'm thinking, what is freedom? We talk about freedom, freedom. And so I broke it down to its most fundamental uh, way, and that it, to me, freedom is the, the, uh, the, the spirit of, of love that God places in our heart. Freedom is a spirit. It is a spirit, and you can share it. And that's what's so beautiful about, about freedom. And so, uh, so what is what is government doing in this freedom situation? Our, the job of government, the moral responsibility of government, is to defend that freedom. That is why we elect our representatives to defend our freedom, everybody's freedom. Okay, and so uh, veterans are very aggressive about this issue. Uh, we uh, are now having a movement to have a veterans organization for DC State in every single state. We got Pennsylvania covered. We got Florida covered. Maryland, DC, Virginia, and so we are beginning to uh, name representatives. Uh, that will organize in each of those states. We're going after the veterans, and we're going to challenge the veterans also in those states uh, uh, to support us. And we fight for their freedom too. Okay, so this is very important to us. Uh, DC is, uh, you know, it's a special fraternity because I was uh, born in Puerto Rico, moved to Lorain, Ohio, at the age of seven. And then I went into the military and I came out, and when my brother invited me to D.C., there was something special about D.C. I said, I'm coming back. And I came back. And I've been fighting for D.C. statehood ever since. And I've, I've met a lot of wonderful people like you in the movement. We're going to increase our movement. The veterans, I assure you, veterans are going to be as aggressive for D.C. statehood as we have been aggressive on the battlefield. Uh, we love our country, we're loyal to our country, and we want to make sure that every single individual in our country is free. And so I'll take any questions later after this, but I want you to know that the veterans were, right, were on board. I've been the executive director for the past 27 years. Well, we are involved in information gathering, sharing, networking, community organizing, and advocacy. ACC um, got involved uh, in the statehood struggle in the early 1990s. And for nearly a quarter of a century, uh, 25 years, we were the only East of the River organization uh, that was involved. Uh, we were one of the first members of DC Votes, the Voting Rights Coalition, and we are currently involved in the local uh, state red table uh, coalition. Uh, the Anaconda Coordinating Council does extensive tabling throughout the community uh, regarding any number of issues. For example, we were on the front lines of COVID in terms of doing uh, of, of doing the outreach for testing the Eastern River, as well as being one of the seven organizations that was chosen by the mayor to do door-to-door uh, -door, uh, outreach to uh, to encourage people to get vaccinated. Uh, and all of our, and all of our tabling, uh, tabling throughout the community, we always have information about statehood. I know um, uh, Kelsey can attest to how I worry DC vote to death about, uh, you know, I had the, you know, I had buttons, I need information, but we're out there, you know, like every single week. And uh, we have 
in, 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 or in terms of getting the information out throughout the community, ACC has involved uh, itself in organizing visibility uh, campaigns of the state, particularly including high school students. We have recruited uh, community residents to the river to go on Capitol Hill to lobby. We have uh, paid for the buses to get them on the Capitol Hill because we basically in ACC feel that first, uh, that it was first and foremost a civil and human rights uh, issue, and and we, it, it should have all of the type of trappings and substance and style of the civil rights movement uh, for African Americans. Um, it was the late Senator uh, Ted Kennedy who said that the issue of D.C. second-class status will never become a part of the national conversation until it rises as a, to the level of a personal insult among, among the people who live here. Uh, I just like you to feel very viscerally and passionately about this, and that's why I have been arrested twice uh, in, uh, in statement demonstrations. Uh, and ACC is taking uh, uh, some pages from the civil rights of uh, lexicon. Uh, Dr. Martin Luther King and other civil rights uh, leaders were intentional, unabashed, and unapologetic about getting uh, religious leaders involved, getting young people involved. Not even young, I mean, we're talking about elementary school kids. They helped to break the back. Of, uh, of, 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 of the jury segregation in Birmingham. And we have to do the same thing here in, uh, in the district. And to that end, that is why for the past two years, uh, ACC uh, received one of the grants, or one of the DC voting rights and state of grants from the Office of the Secretary. And we have sponsored, uh, we have sponsored contests for young people. We have worked with the Marion Barry a Summer Youth Leadership uh, uh, Program to, to have these contests involving essays, uh, poetry, TikTok, uh, rap, uh, and these are two examples, and we can continue uh, to do that. And, uh, and then we have a go-go concert, which is streamed live nationally, so tens of thousands of people are getting the message, particularly young folks. So we're going to continue to do that. We're very pleased to have a partnership with the league, which has been a sponsor of our concerts for the past two years. And we are going to be there to be, to be involved in quilts and advocacy, because not only are we bringing some wonderful art uh, to East of the River, but we're bringing a message. And I will definitely be glad to get involved, because I am a member of the league. <laughs> Hi. So, well, can folks a little closer? All right. And off. There you go. All the people. All the people. Um, okay, now, yes. Hi, my name is Amber Taylor. I am the communications director for the UCLA Youth Insurance Club of Columbia. Some mouthful, I know. Um, the American Civil Liberties Union is one of the oldest nonprofits um, that is dedicated to protecting the civil rights and civil liberties of the um, over 700,000 residents of the district, along with federal employees. We are in the process of activating our 14,000 members across the district and our 4 million members nationwide to, to understand the importance of why DC statehood is an issue that they need to be having with their neighbors, with their friends, contacting their senators and representatives to support this issue. But I, I think that, you know, as we're talking about the need for DC statehood, to what often gravitates me to this issue is like how this issue touches literally everything, every aspect of our lives here in the district. You know, recently there's so much outrage about the Dobbs decision, the overturning of Roe v. Wade. And this is an issue of how Congress has for decades been getting its uh, hands into DC's business. We have the Dornan Amendment, which is an amendment that Congress has specifically just for DC that tells DC that we cannot use our taxpayer dollars to, um, to, you, to take our Medicaid dollars to fund abortion, which if you go to Maryland, you go to Virginia, you can do that. These are the types of things that make this issue like so powerful to me because 
43% of the people trying to get abortions here in the district are black people, or they're, they're black women. And we know that DC has been a hub for abortions across the country for quite some time. But this goes back as, you know, as well. In um, 1998, uh, we had a needle exchange program where, these, um, where Congress barred us from having some basics around you know, giving needles and having a needle exchange program here in the district, which at the time when it was listed in 2007, we, DC had the, one of the highest per capita rates of HIV and AIDS. These are the ways in which Congress, people who don't live here, who don't love the residents of DC, are getting their hands into what we're, we have going on here, mm -hmm. are getting way of our values. Um, and this is why we are so excited to be partnering with more groups, partnering with the groups here today, to spread the message about what's going on, what the what movement we are activating and continuing to fight, uh, to fight for, um, and you know we're going to continue our fight in our courts, we're going to continue our fight in Congress, we're going to continue our fight in legislators, and of course in the streets. Um, I would encourage y'all to go to dcstatehoodnow.org, which has all types of information related to history, um, you know facts to help dispel some of the rumors and some of the mistruths out there that some people uh, that make it to themselves politicians might be pushing. Um, you know, so that we can actually get the real truth out there. And that's again, that's ccstatehoodnow.org. Um, uh, and I think that for me, as somebody who, you know, is from Baltimore, um, you know, comes to DC, you know, fall in love with the city, I have, you know, I'm, I'm used to people like treating black folks as though we're second class citizens already. And it breaks my heart to see how my brethren and, and sisters across, you know, across the river, across, you know, just a couple, um, couple miles down the road, are being treated. And this is something that should be unacceptable to all people across our country. And, and as more people learn about what's going, on, what's really going on in D.C., the, the more people who understand that D.C. is just Congress, this is White House, it's you know the rich culture and beauty that has happened here. The more the more they are supportive in, in telling their uh, their congressmen, their senators, um, congressmen as well, um, to support DC statehood. And you know, really excited to continue this fight for long term. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. goes on here, we also know what it was like to have right to vote at one point, so that really sticks with us. Our, um, just in terms of how to reach us, our website is statehood4dc.org, and it has contact information there. We're also in the resource booklet. So um, what are we trying to do? Well, honestly, we're, we're echoing a lot of what you've heard today, which is we uh, want to educate uh, people across the country on DC statehood, how it affects them, and why it matters. Um, and like you've heard today from Kelsey and from Barbara, we think that doing it in creative ways is an angle that um, we believe in and, and is a way to communicate to people the message of 
DC statehood and, and, and get information out of creative ways. So just to give you an idea of some of the things we've done, um, when we were working with Nook, we did a 50 for 51 mural project where uh, the DG DPW had launched a mural project across all eight wards. We collected all of the photos, we put them in collages representing each ward with information on each ward, and then sent them out on social media. Um, the, con the goal there was to make sure people understand that DC is not just the White House, it's not just Congress, that people actually live in DC. Um, we produced a, uh, with Joanna Pratt and Steve Samuels, uh, a lot of hard work on that end, we um, produced a video called our 50 for 51 video, which has um, people from every state um, holding up a DC statehood sign and with information on why, you know, what, what's going on here and with a, a direction on how people can contact their representative. We have our Flat Eleanor project. Some of you might have seen Flat Eleanor. Okay, is it modeled on Flat Stanley? So, and actually, League of Women Voters has has had um, some activities for kids. So we talk about getting kids involved. That's one of the ways. Thank you, Anne, for supporting that. And and we put photos of people with Flat Eleanor all over. Um, you know, hopefully uh, everywhere they visit, um, and, and part of it is we also, as part of that, in the packet they get includes all this information on DC statehood. Um, we also sent out flat Eleanor holiday cards to um, Congress members who we thought would be, um, you know, who, who supported our cause or could support the cause. Um, currently, and this is something that's been brought up quite a, a bit, um, we have currently an issue focused. Uh, media, social media campaign, where we basically have an uh, image of someone supporting DC statehood, but the, the, the information is why DC statehood, question mark, it is a gun control issue. Right? That's what we just put out a couple of days ago. Last month we said it's an abortion rights issue. The very first image that we did to launch it basically has DC statehood in the middle with all of the different issues that everyone has been talking about. Because of the point that everyone is making here, and that we are trying to promote also, is DC statehood is about all the issues that people care about. So while we're looking, while we do care about what goes on with people here, we want to make sure that we are that, that they recognize it's relevant to them. And then lastly, I don't know if there are any more, but we have a bookmark. And if anyone is having an event and you would like to have our bookmark, please let us know. Um, and what do we need to succeed? What we need is for people to like, share, like and share our posts. So we've been sending out emails to organizations with our posts, asking people, you know, can they please share it? If you're getting those emails, please consider sharing our posts. We really appreciate it. If you have not been getting our emails, if you're willing to participate with us in this, please contact us and let us know. And again, here's what everyone else has said, and I'm always finished is um, we all really need to work together. We need to work together. So I'm hoping that we will thanks to the League of Women Voters for doing that, putting us together. All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, I first just want to say, of course, thank you to Anne and the League of Women Voters uh, for having us today and, uh, uh, you know, generations of advocates before me so lucky to follow. Um, I'll start with a quick anecdote. Uh, I was called for jury duty coming up soon. And uh, of course, as a resident of DC, you know, we don't have representation, but I will be serving on a jury on the day of the election. So that's kind of a double irony right there um, you know, that we, we don't have the rights to. But um, I'm here today to talk about two uh, projects I've been working on. The first one is called uh, the DC Statehood Pledge. Um, and that is basically a campaign that asks federal, state, and local candidates and elected officials running for office around the country uh, to publicly support statehood. And uh, started that about three years ago uh, during the 2020 election, and it was mainly created um, because I saw an issue that there wasn't really a way for, uh, there wasn't a common place for non-federal candidates running for office to support statehood. Uh, you know, before, it was basically if you were in Congress, you could co-sponsor and vote for the federal legislation, but there wasn't much for state candidates or non-incumbent candidates to do. Um, so today, the DC State Pledge, uh, as of this morning, was uh, 985 
signers, but we received five more. We received five more just during this event today, so we're up to 990. So I think we'll get to 1,000 um, within a couple hours. Um, and it, you know, I know this is a nonpartisan event, so I'm not going to mention any names, but there are Democrats and Republicans and independents. There are judicial, uh, executive, and legislative candidates um, really across the spectrum. Um, and I hope that statehood advocates here can use that as a tool to find out, number one, who supports statehood, and number two, add to it if you have candidates that you know um, to, to support statehood. Um, and there was a question earlier about what we're doing to prepare for this new incoming Congress. And you know, several of these signers are current nominees for the U.S. Senate. Uh, maybe I'll name a few names. Uh, John Fetterman, Mandela Barnes. Uh, you know, these are people coming in that already support statehood and will hopefully then immediately co-sponsor the federal legislation. Uh, the second campaign is called the DC Statehood Compact, and it ties nicely into the first part because the pledge is really the first step. You know, we ask them to support the issue they do. The second step here is to make them take action on their support. So the compact is a campaign that asks state legislative and executive uh, elected officials to act on their support. So that started about two years ago during the 2021 legislative session. It's basically the federal legislative strategy on a state by state level. So um, We've introduced resolutions and supporting letters in 26 states around the country in the last two years. Um, and those have, uh, those are made up of 500 current elected official supporters. These are co-sponsors, these are letter signers, they voted for these resolutions. Um, and thank you so much to the League of Women Voters who have helped us submit supportive testimony for those resolutions in states around the country. And of course, at first, we focused on states like Arizona and Maine and West Virginia to urge those members of Congress to support the federal legislation. Um, plus, these state elected officials usually end up running for higher office at the federal level. So getting their support now is kind of getting the, the work done early that way when they, when they eventually move up, uh, we are got friends. So um, obviously, ways you can support, you know, asking your candidates or elected officials to support these two Projects, so feel free to reach out to me. Um, you know, visit the websites. Uh, the pledge is dcstatehoodpledge.org. The compact is dcstatehoodcompact.org. And uh, of course, follow us on Twitter, uh, dc underscore pledge and dc underscore compact.
we, BC for D doesn't have much of funding, so we could really use teaming up with um, you all, um, especially if anyone knows how to get grants or um, somehow um, has the funding, we could team up with you for the phone bank. Also, you know, we have been thinking about possible postcard campaigns. Um, Alaska, Senator Murkowski, if she wins her race, Arizona, West Virginia, I think we should just say, oh, go straight on. You know, go get the Senate. You know, I don't think, I think we should take um, a lot of action. Um, even though it seems to be stalled, I don't think we should really give up hope. I think we should just sort of make our, ourselves known and eventually things could turn in our favor. <clears throat> it, it seems entrenched, you know, that the senators are against it, but it, it, I don't think it's necessarily going to stay that way. Um, also, another project that I think would be amazing is a DC People's Lobbying Group, um, which would be a group of us um, getting together who are interested, meeting with each senator's office in turn who is not on board to discuss statehood, troubleshoot their false conceptions, bring our situation fully home to them, and <clears throat> then keep up a running dialogue with their office. And we're coming to an end. Can we have a stop sign? Okay. Thank you. <laughs> So coming to college from Cape Cod, Massachusetts, I didn't really know much about this issue. And I only really started to educate myself on the issue when I started interning for Senator Paul Strauss. And it definitely gave me a sense of all the struggles that the citizens of DC have been facing. And Many young people aren't educated enough on this issue, especially in their own schools coming from different states. And it doesn't really seem like there's much that young people could do about this issue. But with education, many students who educate themselves will later develop into future leaders who can help make decisions on making this issue turn into something that can give equality within DC. Therefore, our organization works towards educating other individuals and we strive to practice inclusivity and stress the importance of DC statehood. So I will definitely take you up on the offer of gaining your insight and allowing that to spread towards our organization within AU. And I, if you have any questions, I'll be here. I can give you my phone number. But I'm very excited to put this group back into motion. So thank you. So this is the right approach, and, and Noah's doing exactly the right thing. 
I also should have mentioned, by the way, because Phil talked about getting arrested, that Denise Jenkins from Stand Up for Democracy, she was arrested and went to trial eight times and was never convicted. And I told her eight breath arrests and no conviction should automatically make her the governor of New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs>
Okay, not 15. Because one time I did it, it was 15. I was like, 15? I was like, wait a minute. What's up? And you're going to get some knees up. We're going to do a little more motion. We're going to go five, one, five, one. Five, five, one. That's the whole thing. So we're going to put all three of those together. So five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, and one, two, three. Four and five. One, five, one. Hold oh, that. All we need now is a beat. If you can do it, um, get the beat because the game is just count. So we just count the beat of the song. You can always go one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. So I don't know if we can get a little music to try to do something really cool. Some music I can try to play. You'll, you'll lint on the way. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Hard to tell. <laughs> over the laws that are passed. 
So as we understand the talking points and the narrative, we're able to really communicate to people all across the country how the District of Columbia has residents that are made up of our armed services, veterans, teachers, first line, first responders in all different sectors, but we do not have all of the inalienable rights that are due to us as American citizens. So regardless of your race, creed, color, sexual origin, or nationality, the fight for statehood is a civil rights issue because it is, it is necessary to ensure that our votes count and that when we elect elected officials when they pass legislation that it matters. So I know that I'm preaching to the choir, but it's always, it's always an honor to be among other leaders that are at the forefront of doing this work because ultimately to be able to advance statehood, it's going to take a collective effort from all of us being able to work together, work across the aisle, and work across the country so that people understand the importance of statehood. It's not just about our member of Congress having a vote. It has such a, a larger and more significant impact on our daily lives. So I thank you all for your work. I thank you all for your activism. I thank you all for your service. And I wish you all peace and power.
QR code, you can just access the resource directly that way, or you can find it on our official on our Envision Statement page on our website. So I'm going to give you 15 minutes. It's time. If you please, if you're only with a couple, join another table. Let's let's talk.
Is it on? Yes. Okay, um, a couple of things. The um, study will say who you are. Oh, I'm Caroline Petty, Ward 5, Brooklyn, and Lake Brother Voters, BC Democrats. Um, a couple of things. Uh, we, we talked about ideas that came up during the, today's uh, conference that we were really uh, interested in and that really piqued our imagination. And one of those was uh, education, starting early with our youth. Um, a couple of people mentioned uh, that as a, as a goal and, and as a new activity or continuing with an old one. Um, and we were wondering as an ask from our group, um, we were interested in this curriculum that it apparently is being used in the DC schools. And if, if it would be possible to find out more about that and get maybe copies of it um, if possible and, and make sure that it's being disseminated as widely as we hope it, it is. That was one thing. Uh, another is the, um, it was pointed out that we have a digital divide in the city, um, particularly uh, among seniors who aren't necessarily computer savvy, savvy or digital savvy, savvy, and how important it is um, in whatever we do um, that we make uh, our activities and our literature, for instance, accessible to non-digital savvy um, citizens, seniors in the city. Um, and one idea was, um, you know, the voters' guides that goes out, go out, the, the um, League of Women Voters' Guide and also the city's guide for, for voters might be a good place, even if it's not on the ballot, but to just have some basic educational material on DC. And then on this, lastly, on the subject of money, I'm uh, always interested in uh, budgeting more money, both for um, the citizens groups like our own that are, that are working on these issues, but also for our elected statehood delegates. Um, and that that budget uh, ought to be um, something that we can depend on and ought to go up every year in connection with inflation. All right, thank you very much. I'm reporting out to this fabulous table. Uh, we have about three areas that we really spoke, uh, we'd love to have the community focus on. Um, Hector was speaking on behalf of their institution statehood that they're really interested in energizing veterans all over the country about this because they certainly understand the issue and they are going to be spending some time, energy, and money on that. They are looking for ideas, brainstorms, connections around the country with people who uh, you think can get involved in all of this. And so, Hector, you're going to raise your hand, and this is, you know, oh, let's see. We have, DC has more Medal of Honor winners than any, than all, than any state in the nation. Wow. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, that's true. We got more Medal of Honor winners than any other state in the nation. And, and there are a lot of organized veterans group here that we all bump into, be it a museum on our street or anybody else, and uh, let's help them create those connections. Uh, Phil talked a lot, and we all did at the table, about the faith community and uh, how there are so many faith communities, and maybe you could uh, help them organize uh, a weekend of everybody's giving the same sermon from whatever pulpit, from whatever faith they are, be it. You know, stay good Shabbat or stay good Sabbath or stay good Sunday. Um, let's see if we can help uh, put a little fire on this issue of justice, no matter what your uh, your brand is. Um, and uh, yeah, Bill's done it in his own congregation, and would like to scale it up. And I think we all have connections in many faith communities, and it's an issue that should uh, really resonate. And the other one, of course, is money. <laughs> and uh, we were talking about how it looks like the mayor's office has put money behind statehood. Uh, we'd like to urge them to share it in the community. But all of these groups that have risen up and the same 
pot is now getting split many more ways. There's lots more competition. And even if the money has increased uh, on the district budget, maybe we to ask our leaders uh, to share it outside their own offices. And that they can do their coordination work, but there's a lot of energy here that could be some funding. You know, uh, we were basically just thinking overall increased public presence and developing a strategy so that we can get involved and like work with the DC government uh, more closely and for them to be a bit more aggressive as we talked about today um, with their strategy of publicizing um, why statehood is so important, especially for folks who come into the city. Um, and maybe they're driving in, you know, and we all know that parking is insane in the city, so at some point they're gonna be like, yeah, two dollar, two dollar metro ride sounds a little bit better. Um, so having like ads and videos within the metro, so when they see like, this is uh, why statehood is so important. Did you know that you're in the district and folks who live here full time don't have two senators like you do? They don't have voting representative in Congress. They might be like, oh, like, what would I do if I didn't have somebody representing me? Of course, for the folks who are more politically involved, uh, because not everybody is that concerned about their seniors. But having that and just making sure that everybody who comes in is aware of one of my philosophies is like one of the best tools of advocacy is being a little annoying sometimes. So by the time they leave, like I was saying to my table, um, they should at least know uh, where the National Mall is and that residents of DC deserve statehood. So that was our thing. All right. Thank you. My back name. Hi, Julie Belt. Um, uh, the League of Women Voters got me here, so I'm going to thank the League of Women Voters for ordering it up. The biggest thing I think that our table kind of, we talked around about coming to two main themes that came up today, um, and that was around the, coord the coordination and the amplification of the efforts that are already happening. There are a lot of people in this room who are doing a lot of work. And when you take all people in this room and you think about who's one degree of separation away from them and think about the amount of work, the valuable work that all those people are doing, it amounts to a whole lot that isn't getting enough recognition. <coughs> so one of the things we were talking about is figuring out what the central coordination, like a hub of coordination is for everyone in this room who's doing something to figure out what all of the other people are doing. So we don't duplicate efforts and we aren't doing double work whenever we should be able to be doubling our work. Um, we were talking about uh, you know, amplifying that and getting out to people who are beyond the district so that's going to require us to use digital pieces um, and what it would look like to do that on social media. And then immediately as social media comes up and everyone kind of gets stressed, I'm not good at that, we're going to need to hire somebody, we can't hire somebody, or we're going to choose your budget, we don't have time to hire somebody because we don't have enough time because we are at our max time bandwidth. And we talked about instead of thinking about social media or digital outreach from a 52 weeks a year and having to divide all of our attention to those 52 weeks a year, planning a one week activism week and potentially strategically, we discussed having it in January, the week after newly elected representatives are sworn in. So that we can all focus and we all know we start playing now what everyone else is sharing, what everyone else is doing, what everyone else needs amplified, what everyone else needs help with, and we all talk about it at the same time in January and get really loud with it. 
Um, and one more point that I just want to emphasize that Kelsey had pointed out earlier, and she said again at our table, was people don't resonate with the messaging that's going on right now. If you don't live in DC and you don't care about this issue, statehood might not even be a word that makes sense to you. We have, as Kelsey said, the DC State Fair. Well, when people hear we have a DC State Fair, they automatically assume that we have, that we just aren't called a state. It's like comparing a civil union to a marriage, right? We all know that's not the same thing. DC State Fair is not a state fair, because we're not a state, so we're not having a state fair. So really getting clarity on messaging, time around messaging, strategy around messaging, and hard from messaging.
Yeah, uh, Julie's report mentioned the digital piece, the outreach, etc. Uh, I vividly recall when um, Eleanor Holmes North was at a meeting of the Democratic State Committee. Yeah. Was at UDC's Community College at Baptist. This was a couple of years ago, and she was asked the question: What could the just ordinary um, resident? This is in the District of, of Columbia do to help the cause. She says she needs social media, folks who really know digital stuff, because she says that she is constrained by whatever the arcane rules are, that she cannot do uh, that type of really intense digital stuff because of that. And it was, at the time, she said, one of the major I don't want to say failures, but you know, our challenges is that we're really not doing social media uh, to the point where the message is really getting out across the country. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to bring this to a close. What I want to say, first of all, is thank you, and everybody. And yes. what are the what are the answers right. to the questions? Uh, I also, I also, I also wanted to make sure our, we asked people to put comments in from the oh, live okay. stream to contribute to the table if we're out. Oh, good. Sorry. Um, so we just wanted to uh, just flag one comment that came in in particular from here, um, which I asked for all of your attention and I had lost the comment because I was also busy reporting out on your comment. Um, but I think uh, uh, Nathaniel Pendleton wanted to also just share his resource at v for dc 2 on Twitter where he's been indexing photographs, other things related to social media that people could use to get the word out. So let me say that again. It's at v for dc 2 which is DC State of News. You can track that on Twitter. So okay. just wanted to share that resource that might help with that social media activity. Right. Thank you. What, what are the answers to these questions? Oh, the answers! All right, let's see. Somebody, somebody, start reading out the answers. Come on, who you got one? Why don't we move the question so that can fill All right, let's go. Let me get up. Yeah. Let's not forget about the microphone. Maryland is called? Right, and it won't work 
because it requires approval by three entities. Actually, I don't know if you can tell it's three. The Maryland State, State of Maryland, the District of Columbia, and the Congress. And by the way, we voted for statehood. Maryland has voted with a yeah, a resolution that said, no, 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 we don't want to do that. Um, D.C. residents pay more taxes than 22 or 23 states, depending on which year. And more, more residents than these two states. Okay. Although D.C. seems to have a lot of local control, who can sell over rural and you are? And then, and even revoke the local oh. charter, right? You know, they already did that in 1874. They said, oh no, we don't, we can't do a territorial government, we don't want to. And because the D.C. justice system is federalized, D.C. residents are sent to prisons, federal prisons all over the country. D.C.'s current budget is funded by local taxes. All right, you come in the state. The Washington, D.C. Douglas Commonwealth Admission Act provides for a two-year transition. Smooth. Yeah, orderly. Overseen by a state of transition commission of 18 people. And at the end of this transition, D.C. residents will hold a constitutional convention and vote on a new constitution. constitution. The Washington Douglas Commonwealth State Constitution provides for a legislative assembly of members, a speaker, four members elected at large, and two representatives from each legislative district instead of one. All right. We have now passed this test. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, I please give us a couple weeks to gather all of this information, and we will get a, a, an email from us. Kathy, can you please come here on five remarks?
Um, so please take a lead button, or I mean the safer button, there's bunches on the table. Take a lead pen, use it to join the lead, also <laughs> to join any of the other organizations that have, have uh, presented today. Use it to help somebody register to vote. Maybe they need to update their address or their name so that if they get their ballot, their vote by mail ballot. Or you can come help us um, table for voter registration around the district. We are um, have been invited to be in Georgetown and Patagonia every day between now and election day for voter registration to get out the vote. They're getting all the volunteers to come to the um, so, and we're working in high schools. We have a team going into some of the high schools as well. Um, I go to the prison, I mean, the jail, DC jail, CPS and CPS, twice a week. I'm going to be going to the Prince George's County jail as well, twice a week. Um, and we're hoping to go to the Federal Bureau of Prison facility that are within a five hour drive to help our UC voters register. As we heard a couple of times today, our um, over 4,000 incarcerated residents are scattered to, uh, out to the state um, in 88 of the 122 Federal Bureau of Prison facilities. We guys are in Hawaii. I kind of thought I would love to go help them register to vote, but Sadly, I don't think I will be able to do that. But um, we need your help, um, and all of us together, we're going to make this happen. So, um, one other thing I'll say that's just my little pet tool that all of us can use it's my favorite key on the computer uh, keyboard, and it's an asterisk. So, when you get an email that says, Call your senator call your representative and you sit there and you scream or you maybe you hear my scream when I get those emails like who the blank do you want me to call? I want you to write back to those organizations and say if you would please put an asterisk by representative or senator with a corresponding note to mention that there are 700,000 people living in the District of Columbia who have no one to call. Please support D.C. statehood. Please support full rights for D.C. And you think it just goes into the wherever on the computer, but eventually those organizations do that. And if we all do it enough, it's done every little time. And, and we heard all day today how important it is to get the word out to everybody around the country, as well as to our own D.C. people who Put it on and get used to it, right? But let's really work uh, because sometime soon we will be Douglas Commonwealth, and that's due to all of us here and all of the work. So thank you again for spending the day with us. Thank you again, Anne, and the whole um, state team who put this event together. So we're grateful. We're grateful for all of you and all of your efforts. Thank you, Sarah.